this in Cayman News. Okay, so uh, our next speaker will be uh, Dan Skaminski, giving a talk about the black ops of, of uh, TCPIP, including some uh, interesting findings about uh, Bitcoin, UPOP, and uh, TCP. So without any further ado, please give a warm round of applause for Dan Kaminsky. Of a, record, of a transaction 
is mixed with a cryptographically hard problem. A problem so hard, it takes everyone in the world working as hard as possible 10 minutes to go ahead and do this job. You might say, well, how do you have a crypto problem that takes 10 minutes? Well, if it takes one minute, you make it harder and harder and harder until it takes 10 minutes. It's like a problem for math class. You know, you can, they can just keep throwing numbers on there, and you're just going to keep working longer and longer on it. It turns out in crypto, you can very easily increase the difficulty of a problem. And so it's, it's kind of like gold mining, only the gold gets harder to find, literally, like it actively makes it so harder to find the harder you look for it. Um, so it's like, it's like a post gold, it's kind of cool. And then if you do this, you, if you are the one who hits the lottery, who completes the hard problem, you get 50 bitcoins, which then goes back to the beginning and you can distribute that wealth elsewhere. So that's you know, the long and short of, uh, of bitcoin. And uh, I need to have my phone out so I know what time I'm at. Um, now the truth of Bitcoin, first of all, this is not my Bitcoin talk. I don't want this to all be a talk on Bitcoin. But I needed to explain what was going on. Um, Bitcoin's really impressive. Like, Bitcoin's in probably the top five most interesting things that have happened in security in the last 10 years. Um, entire classes of bugs are just missing. See, normally we see some software we're like, oh, wow, that's pretty useful, but I'm going to scratch the surface and it's going to be crap. Bitcoin's like the exact opposite. Like, you look at it as a security guard, you're like, oh, man, this thing's written in C, it's listening on the network, all these nodes in the world are listening, and if there's a hole, you get money. This is the worst case scenario for software, but the implementation is, it's like, it's spotless. It's crazy spotless. Um, it's actually really funny. Ask me later, I'll explain how. Bitcoin has a situation where it's like, there are major game-ending bugs that are not there because lines of code are missing. Like, you can tell the bug was there, and then someone's like, ah, gone. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually really cool. Um, so they fixed almost all the flaws that aren't forced by the design. Um, the main flaws, though, are, well, it doesn't scale at all. Totally not anonymous. Um, scalability, you don't even need to tell you, you just go to Bitcoin's own scalability page. And they're like, yeah, you know, eventually we're gonna need to exchange like a gigabyte a second. And uh, well, you know, you're gonna have to have like 50 cores dedicated running 100 percent at all times just to keep up. And a three terabyte hard drive is only two hundred dollars. You only need to buy one every 21 days. What? What's the problem? Yeah, it's not a system that scales. Eventually, you, uh, uh, you need to have these super nodes that handle all the work of being part of Bitcoin. Um, and the super nodes look a heck of a lot like banks, because they're basically banks. So welcome to the new boss, it looks a heck of a lot like the old boss. Um, so this, a lot of the properties of Bitcoin that people like, that nobody's in charge and all that, yeah, they go away, and they go away because as soon as the thing gets popular, you, you need banks to keep up. Um, but that's not why I'm talking to you about Bitcoin. Um, one of my good friends, Travis Goodspeed, uh, thought it would be uh, interesting to say, hey Dan, do you think we can use Bitcoin, which is taking all of this data and distributing it throughout the entire world and has a whole bunch of money depending on this data never getting lost, do you think we could like hide stuff in there? And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's no reason we couldn't. Um, so, uh, I don't know how many of you guys know this, uh, uh, our community recently lost one of its shining lights, a guy, uh, uh, Len Sassman. If um, you take the core database now of Bitcoin and you run a strings bytes equals 20, what strings does is strings actually extracts human readable text from uh, any file. If you run this on the Bitcoin database, if you look for human readable text, you will, it's actually it's 450 megabytes from a month ago, I'm sure it's like six or 700 megs now, you will actually see a, um, an ASCII version of Len Sassman, which will be stored forever along with, uh, along with our tribute to him. And just because Len would have found it hilarious, we also put in a version of Ben Bernanke. <laughs> um, so 
So how this works, Alice gives money to Bob by issuing a sort of challenge. Um, Whoever can sign this message with the public key that hashes to the following bytes may claim this money. Well, bytes, bytes. Instead of pushing the hash of a public key, which is 20 bytes, we push some arbitrary text that string is able to find. And it's 20 characters of a testimony. That's why it was 20 characters wide. Um, this does cost some Bitcoin. And that was about one Bitcoin in total. Um, it does, in fact, destroy the money. Um, the network of Bitcoin is thoroughly convinced somehow, somewhere in the world, there is a public cryptographic key that has the hash of, Len was our friend. I am totally okay with that. Um, you know, cyber equivalent of pouring one out for your homie. Can we get higher bandwidth? Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin lets you send money to a public key directly rather than its hash, so you can get a 10x increase from 20 bytes to 200 bytes. Um, uh, not mentioned here, uh, <laughs> not mentioned back at DEF CON, uh, so some other people have actually started putting stuff in the Bitcoin chain. This is freaking classic. Um, so if you're one of the people who's actually mining Bitcoins, like, you know, winning that lottery every 10 minutes kind of thing, there's a thing called the Coinbase that you can put an arbitrary amount of money into, uh, information into. And it's arbitrary. I mean, you can get up to like the two megabyte limit if you are the Coinbase calculator. Um, so yeah, there's some Catholic guy who's been putting in a bunch of prayers. It's really weird. Like, it's, it's weird. <laughs> and like, you go to the forums and it just gets like creepy. The dude's apparently not a fan of religious freedom, and I don't know what the heck's going on. Um, but yeah, I'm not messing with that. But I was curious, you know, outside of the coin base, is there someone else, uh, and he doesn't, he's not a big fan of us either. So you see, his way is legitimate. Our way, we're a bunch of idiots. Um, but there's a third way uh, to put data. There's another way to put data into a signature. See, Bitcoin works with small programs. Um, there's no hard-coded way of saying, he who has the, uh, uh, he who has the public key that, that, is, uh, that hashes this value should, we can claim the money. You can actually deliver small programs that uh, describe what is required for someone to claim a, uh, uh, distribution of wealth. And there are some limits, to, I mean, there's some hard limits right now to what programs you're allowed to deliver. But the basic one you're allowed to deliver is, here's a program that say, you're going to put this stuff, you put this stuff on a stack, and I will pull off the stack a public key, and I'll hash it, and I'll see what's going on. But what if there's extra material there? What if there's, you know, not just like a public key there, what if there's, you know, a big blob of extra stuff that you wanted to store in Bitcoin forever. Um, well, it turns out that uh, the program doesn't care. The program is only looking to see if the stuff that it wants is there. If there's extra content, well, it's unspecified. So you're allowed to put extra stuff on. Um, so where this gets really interesting is it turns out that you're not you as the person who sends money. You're not the only party that's able to add information. See, I know I'm sort of skipping over things. I apologize if this is a little confusing, but bear with me for a moment. You go ahead and you're, you know, you're trying to send money to your friends. You say, okay, uh, I've got this money here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna push out this transaction that says, this money I have, I, I don't have it anymore. Uh, it is now to be, it is now claimable by whoever has this other key, this other, uh, um, this other information. Now, at some point in the future, that declaration will not just float around and be gossiped, but will actually be part of the official transaction record. But this takes time. This takes however long it takes. In that time in the middle, there's just a signature from you saying, okay, I've signed the fact that I've handed over some money. That signature cannot cover, I'm explaining this terribly, I'm so sorry. The signature can't cover itself. Meaning, you can sign a message saying that I'm giving money to someone else, but your signature, there's a chicken and egg problem. The actual signature itself is unsigned. 
the place where you're putting extra data as an attacker is inside the signature itself. That's the actual location of it. So the problem is, is that the signature is protected from alteration only after it has been embedded into the Bitcoin blockchain. So in between the time that you push it out and then someone else puts it into the official Bitcoin blockchain, anyone in the world can go ahead and throw on extra data. That thing I told you about where you can put extra stuff on, it's not just you can put extra stuff on, other people can add stuff to your transactions. It's, I wouldn't say it's a design flaw, but not pretty. Um, but it is limited usefulness. You, uh, you can only really, really abuse it if you're the guy competing blockchains. And at that point, most stuff in the coming phase. So long and short of it, it is actually possible to do not just you know, embed data in Bitcoin, but a Bitcoin file system is actually technically possible. So what about anonymity? Can we go ahead and embed data into, or can, can we go ahead and figure out who is using Bitcoin? Well, if you go to this website called Block Explorer, you will see a bunch of sources of, so Bitcoin, everything, every time you make a move in Bitcoin, you're always making up a new identity. Oh, I have this ID, I have that ID. And you know, it makes everyone think that Bitcoin is anonymous because you're constantly generating new IDs. Now, the thing is, because of the way internals of Bitcoin, all those identities on the left in the same transaction that are giving money to, so all the people on the left are giving money to all the people on the right. So the people on the left, that's you know, ID plus some amount of money. That's all put into a pile, and then that pile is divvied up into the destinations. All those guys on the left are the same guy, just by the way that Bitcoin works, because all of them had to coordinate to participate and sign the same blob of data at the same time. They're the same ID. So you can actually go ahead and figure out a lot, you know, most of the identities of Bitcoin are linkable. And uh, Reed and Harrigan put out a paper. I was going to announce this. They put out the paper first. They went. Um, they went ahead and did, made all these graphs that went ahead and linked. Okay, so now we can go ahead and figure out. Here's some thief, and then here's all the other identities that he had. And then one of the identities was actually open and identifiable, so we, we busted the thief. Um, he had, Reed and Harrigan happened to get lucky, though. One of the sources of... It's actually a bit tricky to actually get your hands on Bitcoin. I'm not even kidding. If you actually want to go buy Bitcoin, you have to like go get a Second Life account and get Second Life Linden dollars and install the Second Life client and go into Second Life. And then you actually got to go like walk around and find an ATM in polygons. It's oh, it might be there's music. Like this actually happened, right? I needed to go get some Bitcoin and jump into Second Life because I have to authenticate myself. And no joke, every area in Second Life has music playing. So I'm on a journey to journey. It's super weird. Second Life still exists and you can buy Second Life Linden dollars and you can convert Second with PayPal and then you can use Second Life Linden dollars to buy Bitcoin. Oh yeah, that's the, what you think I did this for fun? No, I did it for science. I did it for Lenin, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. The land of polygon dongs, I tell you. Alright. So the deal is, is that uh, linking pseudonyms is in, you know, a couple of the pseudonyms, they read Harrigan got lucky because the pseudonyms, the, the randomly generated IDs, um, they're just like idiots running on me. At one point, one of the guys got, a, got money from a source that published all the IP addresses that it gives money to. Um, another user posted to a forum seeking donation to a linked ID. So basically, outside of Bitcoin, someone has to take one of those pseudonyms and link it to an IP address or a name or whatever. The question is, you know, this is, as, as Reed Harrigan say, much of the analysis they have is circumstantial. We cannot say for certain whether these flows imply a shared agency. There's always the possibility of drawing flawed inferences. The question is, is there another source of data? Well, there are two sources of transaction information in Bitcoin. There's those blocks that have been set in stone. Those actually store until the end of time all the transactions that have ever occurred and then distribute to all the nodes that are participating in Bitcoin. This is why Bitcoin does not scale. 
that there's a second class of information in Bitcoin. Remember, I keep telling you, Bitcoin's got to gossip around everyone. Hey, did you hear Alice gave money to Bob, Bob gave money to Charlie, etc.? Um, it's a big relay race. Alice tells Bob and Charlie, Bob tells David and Eric, Charlie tells Frank and Gary. Um, if an attacker connects to every node in the, uh, in the public cloud, which is not that hard, it turns out, um, the first node to inform you of a transaction is the node that actually is the identity. That's what it turns out to be. Um, you relay it, because basically most people are relaying it, but if you're connected to everyone, the first person, the source of the transaction, tells you first. So it's like, you done relay, you done tell me because you done done it. Um, so I wrote a little piece of code called Bitcoin. Uh, it does an accelerated probing of the Bitcoin network, it just connects to everybody. Um, discovering nodes isn't, isn't that hard. You, uh, you just scan the internet on port 8333, uh, join IRC channels. Um, you can also ask just every node in Bitcoin about every other node in Bitcoin. They'll tell you. Mapping the cloud is pretty much instantaneous. Um, and when you actually ask the Bitcoin people, like, oh yeah, we are totally not anonymous. Tor, Tor doesn't need obfuscate IPs to derive from outbound connections. Um, but it does nothing if you're still listening. So Tor does not protect you from inbound connections. So someone who goes ahead and sweeps the internet and finds your listener, even though your outbound connections are over Tor, your inbound stuff is still linked to your IP. Um, what about unreachable nodes? Well, most are behind NAT and only connect via outbound links. Meaning, if you become most of the if you become most of the network that provides for inbound connectivity, then uh, uh, Generally, all the hidden nodes, all the nodes that you can't connect out to, they will end up connecting to you. Because there aren't, there's only 3,000, um, 3, 8,000 nodes on the internet that, that are uh, um, listening for a Bitcoin at any moment. You probably only need a few hundred with you since each Bitcoin node connects to uh, uh, seven. And you only need one. Here's the thing. How unreachable is a node that is behind that? <laughs> See, most home routers nowadays implement NAT. It's a way of taking one public IP address and separating it out, allowing multiple other, you know, every laptop in the room can be behind the same IP address. That wasn't how it was supposed to work, but it actually does. Now, you might be playing uh, video games, World of Warcraft, whatever, and, uh, um, you might actually want the rest of the internet to be able to make connections back to you so that your video game works. Uh, otherwise, you have the proxy off some central server that isn't necessarily as efficient. So most home routers implement something called UPnP, Universal Plug and Play. It's a way of telling your home router, dear router, please allow the internet to connect back into me. Um, here's what's kind of funny. Uh, UPnP allows nodes inside your network to ask the router to open ports up from the internet. The way that this works is that internal hosts send out a message saying, um, Hi, I'm looking for all the routers. And then the router replies and says, Yeah, I'm here. And then uh, what's supposed to happen is the Yeah, I'm here is supposed to include an address that uh, only hosts on the internal network can find out, that is randomized, and only hosts on the internal network can connect to. It would be really bad if, like, hosts on the outside could connect to this internal facing thing. Like, yes, you want your internal host to be able to say, dear internet, let me in. You don't want the internet to be able to say, dear internet, let me in. Uh, yeah, yeah. It turns out that, like, uh, uh, there's hundreds of thousands to millions of uh, hosts on the internet today that are running that that would otherwise be blocking inbound connectivity from the internet. But it turns out the internet can just ask nicely using the internal protocol on the external interface. And just say, oh hey, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice router you got there. Could you open up some firewall holes? Because I really need to scan your internal boxes. <laughs> so uh, uh, there was a speaker at DEF CON who was, talk who was talking about this, uh, Daniel Garcia. Uh, he actually has an entire UPnP mapper uh, we're actually starting a little UPnP research group. 
to uh, uh, figure out what the, uh, we already have the verbs that you issue to open up ports. We want to see how widespread the problem is. Uh, there are entire countries that have standardized on devices that would otherwise be providing firewalls but don't anymore. Now the thing is, is that you know, uh, most desktops at this point are running host firewalls by default. Uh, so it's not as apocalyptic as it would have been, say, in 2001. Well, it's not good, let me tell you, because uh, there's a lot of crappy devices on your home networks that uh, uh, haven't been exposed and haven't been attacked because there's been no route to them. Uh, never underestimate the security value of a brick wall, uh, but it turns out uh, brick walls don't work too well against bulldozers. What about outside the corporate the consumer space? Um, we don't really have UPnP on corporate networks. We also, it turns out, don't really have that much firewalls, way less than we think. Um, a, lot of, a lot of devices on corporate networks are actually protected from the internet with nothing but access control lists. Dirty little secret, but it's like there's no firewalls, just, well, here's the IP ranges we accept traffic from. And we just sort of assume, you know, no one can connect to us unless they're us with our IP addresses. Uh, well, the old trick is IP spoofing. You just pretend to be a source IP near a target, we'll probably pass the ACLs. People say, but, but spoofing isn't supposed to work, we've got best practices. Best practices means it still works. Um, real world IP spoofing is not hard, as long as you're not like a cloud node. It turns out the one thing the cloud is really good at is stopping you from spoofing your source IP. Um, is IP spoofing still effective? Yeah. Actually, there's a uh, really old trick that you do. Um, what you do is you, you get a node that can go ahead and spoof any IP address, and then you pretend to be a DNS client, and you ask the entire internet for some randomized name. And the key is, but it's inside a domain you control, and the key is you ask as a neighbor of whoever you're asking. So if you're asking 1.2.3.4, you're spoofing traffic from 1.2.3.4, 5.0, something from the same uh, uh, class B network, slash 16, a nearby neighbor. Your goal is to appear to be someone who's nearby, but far enough away that they might be coming from the internet. And now your request gets through the router's access control list, and it hits some named server that uh, is on that protected network. Now the named server just got a request from a neighbor. It's going to send its reply back to the neighbor, but wait, this is DNS. There was a lookup for something at attackerdomain.com. It's got to go ahead and send a request over to attackerdomain.com to find out what the actual uh, value it ultimately needs to send is. And so you, you find out that you've compromised the access control list through the forwarded DNS lookup. It works very, very, very nicely. Uh, now, granted, this only works for like, this obscure application called DNS or UDP. Uh, <laughs> certainly nothing built on TCP, right? Well, I'm a little constrained on time, so I'm going to have to blast through this section. But um, most protocols run over TCP at this point. Um, and TCP prevents you from being able to spoof traffic by kind of having passwords in both directions. Um, Alice has a sequence number to Bob, Bob has a sequence number to Alice. Alice, in order to complete the connection, has to be able to reflect both of those values. Um, basically prove to Bob that she can hear Bob. It's like, Bob says, I'm not going to talk to you until you can prove that you actually hear what I have to say. It's a, it is actually an effective way of uh, reducing the set of attackers that can communicate with you. Um, now, sequence numbers didn't used to be random. You used to just sort of be able to guess them. And there's, oh, great stories involving Kevin, Mythic, and your predictable sequence numbers. Um, it turns out sequence numbers are not entirely random, though. They, uh, they're random unless it could be interpreted as a connection from the same session. Meaning, it's another connection, but it's the same source port, desk port, source IP, desk IP. And uh, effectively, in that situation, what was once randomly selected to have a random password is like, wait, this might get confused. We're going to make this sequential according to time. And it's done with a cryptographic function. Um, so just so you see what's happening here, um, the first and the third sequence number are sequential in time because all the values are the same. 
In the second one, in that middle, we change one byte to the connection to one, no, 2.3.4.6 instead of 2.3.4.5, and the, uh, the sequence number is now wildly different because you want a random password whenever you can get one. So, here's the problem. Um, if someone floods you with connection requests, uh, you have to remember all their passwords, all these sequence numbers, right? So that takes memory, and there's only a finite of memory that you have available. The attacker doesn't have a limit for memory, he just keeps sending you crap and forgetting about it. But you gotta go ahead and remember. So it's called sin flood. It's old as dirt. Um, so the solution they came up was called sin cookies. It's specified back in 1999. Um, and what it is, it says, the password you get is not a path, is not, I'm not gonna remember the password I tell you. You're gonna repeat it back to me. The password I'm going to tell you is an encrypted challenge. You know, server says to the client, you show me that you remember. You show me that you can talk to me. And then I'll, I'll invest the resources in, uh, uh, then I will invest the resources in proving that I can communicate with you, or uh, in communicating with you. Now, the thing is, because I didn't mention this earlier, sequence numbers were not originally designing it to be passwords designed to be connection authenticators. So they're small, they're only 32 bits. Worse, only 24 of those bits are actually used as an authenticator in a SIN cookie. So the, when you actually do the math, this means an attacker who sends you 8 million packets can go ahead and with a spoofed source IP, not only get past your access control list, because all 8 million packets will get past the app because that's the spoofed source but it'll actually be accepted by the destination TCP stack. So you can go ahead and actually have a HTTP payload in those 8 million packets. And if you have an HTTP endpoint that says, if I get a request from a peer IP, I'm going to do whatever it says, because that's a trusted IP address. Um, yeah, and the bad guy can get their stuff through um, just by triggering your uh, sequence number protection. Uh, this is known, Dan Bernstein says it, you know, no matter what function is used, the attacker will succeed in a connection forgery after millions of random hack packets. But you know, he said this in 1999. Eight million packets are a lot easier to send in 2011 than 1999. Um, so you know, bottom line, forged connections can have arbitrary sources, they can get through your ACLs, and um, uh, they can contain arbitrary web services payloads. So uh, uh, long and short, don't be authenticating your web services endpoints with nothing but an IP address and a prayer. Um, are you safe if you disable SIM cookies? Well, here's what's funny. Um, Linux, we have this standard for generating sequence numbers. And like I said, it's random, except if those four source port, set that's four source IP, desk IP values are the same. Linux is totally compliant with this for the lower 24 bits. The upper 8 bits, however, have been sequential. <laughs> sequential incrementing by 1 every 5 minutes. This is how it has pretty much always been when Linux and I were talking about it. He's like, wow, this actually predates my check-in history in the source tree. So this is, you know, it came from the 90s stuff. Um, so what this basically means is that even without SIM cookies, someone can go ahead and, uh, 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 after 8 million packets, uh, inject, a, uh, inject an HTTP request from an arbitrary source IP. Uh, there are some interesting implications for reset attacks, which I'll have to skip over, but the long and short of it is that um, the old attacks from 2005, where you could shut down a TCP session, are made much, much easier when uh, each side of the connection only has 24 bits in the sequence number instead of 32. Um, there's also some possibilities with being able to inject into active TCP sessions. Um, it's a royal pain in the ass. It's possibly the single weakest thing that I've found in terms of, you know, realistically being able to do. But, uh, you basically, this is all I, what, here's the problem. You had 64 bits of security, and it looked great, right? Except you weren't just using it for security. 
we lost 16 bits in each direction because we needed to be able to have what are called window sizes. We needed to have multiple. You know, I don't just want to get data that's right on the nose. Maybe I want to have like data in flight because I'm going over a satellite link. And then I need more than just 65,000 bytes in flight. I need like hundreds of kilobytes, maybe even megabytes in flight. So you have the 64-bit resource, which became a 32-bit resource, which became a 16-bit resource, became an 8-bit, and all of a sudden the security value went away because it's just brute force. So I was joking with Alec earlier, you know, brute force, it's a, it's a hammer, and uh, it's a really, sometimes all you got is that one hammer, but it's a really useful hammer. <laughs> um, there are some pain in the butt with ports. Linux does go ahead and randomize ports on a per session basis. Bug me later if you want to know how this impacts the attack. Uh, status, this is actually old. Um, they're fixing this. Like, uh, the CVE is out, the news is out, the patches are going in. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're just making the sequence numbers fully 32 bit. They're getting rid of that upper 8 bit stuff. They also had MD4. They are not moving into SHA1, they're moving into uh, MD5 as the uh, function. And for this particular use, that's fine. Um, here's a digression. RFC 1948 is an interesting instruction. Uh, can someone bring me water, by the way, because I'm getting a little perched here. Um, RFC 1948 is an interesting instruction. Uh, it basically says that sequence numbers, um, if you know the secret that is used to shuffle them, they're sequential in order. Otherwise, they're random and unpredictable. So what this means is you kind of have like a private component, a, a, you know, the secret mixed with the four tuple that allows you to generate all possible sequence numbers, all the possible passwords. But there's also a public component, uh, a particular sample sequence number that is transmitted over the network. And if you can receive it, you know that particular password. So the private situation is you know every password. The public situation is you know this particular password. Um, so is that public private cryptography with nothing but a password? I mean, that is impossible. And this is hopefully delicious. <laughs> Gentlemen prefer blondes. Anyway. Um, all right, well, clearly we can't do public private cryptography with nothing but a password. It's only possible because I'm playing games with definitions and you know, there's the intersection network security cryptography. All right, what I'm about to tell you is a really bad idea. But that's okay because nowhere does it say when you present at conferences you can only present good ideas. Um, password suck. Constantly being lost, and forgotten, and stolen. They're responsible for 50% of compromises. You know, they increasingly look like leak speak, as if, you know, yeah, because the bad guys haven't figured out that I looks like one and S looks like dollar sign. That's not talking about zero. Dear God, it's like the Hollywood operating system only. We're actually requiring it. It's a best practice. <laughs> Lead speak as best practice. That's right. Oh yes. But that's that's not water. Oh I know that is water. It's actually the water I prefer. Just like when I thought that was vodka. That'd be a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> Alright, listen. Assuming we ignore the fact that passwords are awful and terrible. Assuming we're stuck with them. How and we got an old challenge. How do we use a password to log into a system without that system learning our password? Now the most common answer, the thing we get all angry at companies when they don't do it is, we hash it. We hash the password. Guys, users are still giving the web server the plain text password. An attacker that's hacked your web server can totally hack your web app to log the plain text password after it's inserted. Yeah, you're not pulling it out of the database and mass, but you know, you go ahead and you extract 24 hours of logins into a major web application, you're gonna get a pretty, uh, pretty substantial subset of the user base. Another strategy is uh, to try to use one of these challenge response protocols, something like NTLM or Digest. So don't send me the password, send me the password hashed against this particular random value. Well, guess what? The server still has to store a plain text password or some password equivalent value. 
Um, so there's still stuff to, uh, to go ahead and, and crack offline. Third approach is to try to mix the password with the actual mechanics of a uh, anonymous, otherwise anonymous, uh, Diffie Hellman key exchange. This is what Speak does and SRP does. Uh, it's not standardized in any of the browsers, and that's kind of the problem. You basically end up having to send the user code in JavaScript to do this big, complicated crypto exchange. And you know what the bad guy does? He just has you not do that exchange. Or he adds a little JavaScript to the page that sniffs the password in plain text out of the browser and sends it out of band. So, it seems like a nice idea. Oh, and you still end up with plain text equivalent stuff living on the server. So what do we do? So, is it possible, not advisable, it's obviously a bad idea, but um, is it possible to build a system where the client only remembers the password, but the server stores nothing but a public key, and deploys nothing but a standard already included in the browser challenge to the client to make sure that it has the matching private key, which is derived unilaterally from that password? In other words, can we construct a cryptographic key pair out of a password? Well, here's an interesting question. What was the one vulnerability that impacted all asymmetric crypto systems, be it RSA, DSA, or ECC? Anyone? One bug killed all of them. It was really embarrassing. Named after two people. What was that? Anyway, well, it, I don't even remember the Debian bug, where, uh, yeah, I remember that random number generator that really should be solid before you go ahead and generate a cryptographic key with it. How about we don't have that? <laughs> we have no entropy in there. Um, basically, the problem was that OpenSSL on Debian, um, when it generated random numbers, it always generated the same random numbers. Um, well, all asymmetric crypto systems use entropy as follows. They uh, grab some random bits and then permute those bits. They alter them until they meet certain requirements. Um, and then once permuted, that's your public-private key pair. So if you're always emitting the same random bits, you're always generating the same key pair. Predictable entropy means predictable key pairs, no matter what the algorithm is. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn the Debian bug into a feature. See, cryptography is all about constructions. You know, you have hash functions and string ciphers and block ciphers, all of which can be constructed from one another. We do know how to take a password and construct an everlasting stream with pseudo-random number generator, pseudo-random numbers from it. That's predictable entropy. Um, we even know how to make this transformation both time hard, meaning it requires a whole bunch of CPU to do the conversion from key from password to stream, also memory hard, uh, meaning it takes some huge amount of memory, the kind of memory that a GPU does not have an infinite amount. Um, so the idea is, what if you make the output of a password seeded PRNG the input to an asymmetric key generator? You would basically end up with 2048-bit RSA keys with a trap door in the form of a password. Now this is not theoretical, um, I actually have this. Here's SSH keygen generating a couple of keys, and you'll notice that each time they are different. Now we're going to load a, uh, a little thing called Fidelius that actually hijacks dev random and dev u random and causes them to uh, uh, implement whenever, basically, given a passphrase, in this case, high grandma, it will actually generate the same random numbers every time. And if you have that, these two instances of SSH keygen they suddenly go ahead and always emit the same key. So why is it called Fidelius? It's called Fidelius because Harry Potter properly understood is a story about the epic consequences of losing one's password. Um, Fidelius um, is serious. This is the spell that fails. It's like the point of the entire story, um, at least from an infosec perspective. So uh, Fidelius hooks dev random, u random, a bunch of open SSL stuff, and a few other tidbits to provide a predictable entropy where it isn't expected. It uses the modified version of the S-crypt algorithm to provide, require about one second of processing time, 256 megs of RAM. Basically, it gives you a 
add 20 extra bits of security. It's hard to get past 20, but you know, 20 is better than zero. Um, this does a decent job of making it impossible to, uh, you know, a GPU that would otherwise be trying 700 million passwords a second can now try uh, 32 passwords a second, so I think it's a win. Um, Fidelis gives you generic multi-application support for predictably generating key pairs for passwords. So SSH keygen for SSH keys, OpenSSL for search, Freebird for DNS set keys, they're all, they all get a, they all get a backdoor. Um, so it's not exactly a consensual backdoor, it's impossible to recognize a certificate that does or does not have the, uh, the passphrase behind it. So you can basically sign a message with a password, encrypt a message to a password asymmetrically, um, Bitcoin, you can literally give money to a, a photograph. It's kind of neat. Um, and there's no paid server side. Now, the issues with Fidelity is obviously it's using passwords, so it's crap. Um, the non-obvious ones, it's fragile. You're not just using SSH keygen, you're using SSH keygen 5.3 P1 on this particular platform. Uh, and you're, you're sort of taking all the implicit, unspecified aspects of how entropy is used by an application to generate a key, and you're saying, no, now these must never change. So uh, there, there are definite uh, downsides to this approach. It's also hard to salt. Um, we'll talk about that uh, another time. But I do want to talk about one last thing that is really a, a network thing, and is uh, you know, from this line of research, kind of what people have been talking about the most. And it's all about biased networks. Um, who here is aware about the debates of network neutrality? All right, so here's the deal. Um, there's an end game here. The end game is we're gonna be able to bust off all this stuff. Like the questions of whether or not a network is biased. See, I'm not worried about things where it's just like you can't access something. Because that's, you know, no one's hiding, right? It's like, screw you, you just don't get that port. Okay, you know, that's a policy discussion to have. But what I'm worried about is when networks are just slightly degraded. You don't really know. It's deniable. Um, how can you tell whether something is there or not? Um, what I'm here to tell you is we're going to be able to find biased network policy, no matter how subtle it is. So if biased networks are affecting you, this gives you proof. And if you are biasing your networks, then this is how proof is going to come. So let's look at the basic topology that exists out there in general. Um, you have some clients, there's a router in front of the client, and it talks to the ISP, the ISP has a bunch of internet connections, and those internet connections go to Google or Yahoo or Microsoft. And um, here's the fear. First, some magic box is deployed within the ISP network in front of all of those links. Second, the box matches packets to policies and applies different rules to different packets. Now, these rules can be stateless. Do I like this particular packet? Or they can be stateful. This packet is part of a flow. It's a streaming video going from YouTube. Um, I don't like streaming videos from YouTube, so I'm going to slow that down. Um, the policies can be anything. You can do anything. Limit maximum bandwidth, increase minimum latency. It can even alter the content. So the problem is, is that these policies can be very subtle in their effect. Say Bing.com is 50 milliseconds slower than Google.com. Is this because of the ISP? Or is this because Google.com is better hosting, or you know, the transcontinental links are a little weird today, but only for Google and not for Bing because of where they are on the network? There's many reasons why Bing.com might be slower than Google.com, which means the ISP has plausible deniability. So what we need to do is be able to eliminate that deniability. We need to normalize the network. Whether a given tester is accessing Bing.com or Google.com, the network path, including the server hosting the data, should be identical, or at least uncorrelated with the identity in question. That way, any changes won't be the server, won't be the network path. If there's differential policy around, it's got to be coming from the ISP. So, really simple normalization. Um, let's say there's a policy. All flows associated with an HTTP request with the host www.bing.com should be delayed by 50 milliseconds. Great! Configure a single web server to send HTTP requests for Bing and Google and 
man, that's not even a work. That's squid. That's a proxy server. So you set your client to use something as a proxy server. And if traffic, when the proxy server is proxying Bing, gets, better perform gets worse performance than when it's proxying Google, it's the same server, it's the same network path, and it's got to be the ISP. This is actually going to bust someone. It is the simplest thing you could do today. The problem is it's really protocol dependent. HTTP is basically designed to be allowed for this, um, but other protocols require a lot of work to, to implement and especially emulate. The bigger issue is the policy can be specific to an IP address. You know, you can put a few hundred testers all over the world, and I know people that have. And uh, if you're an ISP, you can just be like, yeah, we, we just don't apply policy to those things. That, you know, your measurement suite is not Google. Your measurement suite is not Bing. And so um, it doesn't matter how many servers you have if the policies are IP specific. So I've been working on a code base, which really should be out right now, but I've frankly been traveling too much. Um, it's called Neuter. It is the network normalization engine. It is a neutrality router. And to explain how Neuter works, how many of you guys have ever used a VPN? All right. Check it out. In a VPN, um, traffic is pushed from your client to some connection broker. We usually call this a VPN concentrator. That VPN concentrator has a batch of IP addresses, and it goes ahead, it goes and talks to Bing, and talks to Google, and talks wherever the heck you're going. And responses go back to that broker. And the responses are encrypted, and sent back to you. So it's like your network connection has been moved over to wherever the connection broker is. You guys with me so far? And when you're using a VPN, all of these ISP policies are basically worthless. I mean, they can filter VPN traffic, but they don't know whether you're connecting to Bing or Google or whatnot. Well, that's a problem. If they don't know, the policies aren't being applied. So we can't tell if the policies are there. Now, we're getting around whatever policies are there, but that's not enough. We got to know that they're there. Um, what if instead of encrypting the traffic back, instead of encrypting the server to client traffic from broker to client, what if we just pass it in the clear? We have it unencrypted. In fact, why don't we spoof the IP addresses from Google? Why don't we pretend it to be Bing? Well, if you do that, why would you do that? Because you want the ISP to see the return traffic. You want the ISP to say, oh, wow, look at all those packets from Bing. I got to slow that crap down. That's what you're looking for. We're trying to trigger the response that would normally be reserved for Bing or Google and get it to apply to our test server. The policy engine can't tell because we're impersonating the source IPs. But the traffic took the same path and it came from the same source. Why is my test server slower when it's pretending to be one IP address than another? That's the game we're trying to get. Now, I may have actually just busted it. Who thinks this doesn't work? Out of curiosity, because you're like a network engineer or something. Anyone? Aww. I always love it when there's network engineers in the talks, because they're like, no, that can't work. There's a bug, or at least there appears to be a bug. Um, the policy engine in this scenario is only seeing return traffic from the server to the client. It's not seeing any of the normal client and server traffic that would be starting up a flow. Because that normal, in a VPN, you encrypt all your traffic to the broker, and it encrypts all the traffic back. All we're doing is not encrypting the traffic back. We're still encrypting the traffic to the broker. Um, so what if? The policy engine says, ah, you know, we know there's these neuter things out there. So we're going to be sneaky. We're only going to apply policy when we see the entire connection, not when we see these weird half situations. You do that. <laughs> it's a trap. Um, check it out. Uh, we got this thing called roto neuter. Um, in normal neuter, you spoof the server to the client. In roto neuter, you do it the other way around. You spoof the client to the server. Say I have two particular, two different sessions that I'm doing a test with. In sample A, the client talks directly to the real Google. 
It's totally legitimate. Client talks to Google, Google talks to the client. Everything is as it should be. And you get a particular care, a particular uh, uh, set of performance. Sample B, the client talks to the real Google by way of the broker. Spoofs the client. And Google replies directly. In other words, the client, the client sitting there goes, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to intentionally make sure that the ISP only sees half the session. So, tunnels the information over the broker. The broker's like, I don't exist. I'm going to pretend the client really directly spoke to Google. And it goes ahead and spoofs the client to Google. Google replies to the client. Client's happy, it sent a package to Google. <laughs> Google replied to the client. But the ISP only saw a half flow this time. Shouldn't be a performance implication, but oh, I think we had a rule that said the policy doesn't apply if there's only half flow. So in this weird ass half flow situation, if things get faster, you have found the policy engine. <laughs> Both samples have the same path. If you get differential policy, that means the ISP has been playing games. Uh, so it's a catch-22. Uh, the ISP applies policy to half flows, neuter differentiates the performance of a spoofed half flow of Google versus a spoofed half flow of Bing. If the ISP applies policies to full flows, roto neuter can differentiate the performance of a full flow to the real Google versus a half flow to the real Google. Either way, I win. So this is the end game. You know, if you've got a biased policy, you might as well be transparent because it sure as heck gets busted. Now, here's the last section. I might go by two minutes, but no more than two minutes. My favorite trick of the talk is here. I, yeah, I gotta let you do it. So check it out. Retaining full flows. Let's say you really want the ISP to, be, to see uh, the full bi-directional traffic. Um, the advantage, why would you want this? Well, it's going to trigger all the possible policies. And you know, if you've got some mandatory NATs in there, you know, you've got to have full flows because the NAT needs to know there's client to server traffic in order to allow the server to reply. Um, disadvantage. If the ISP sees client to server traffic, then the server is seeing the ISP to server traffic. You know, your SYN gets out, it goes leaves your host, hits your router, triggers the NAT, goes to the ISP, keeps going, hits the server, and the server's like, what the heck is this? Because remember, the server is actually supposed to be, there's supposed to be a session from the broker that is being mapped in. It's not actually supposed to be the real server. So the real server may reply, interfere, complain, and so on. So we've got three strategies. The first strategy is, uh, I can't believe it's 2011 and this is useful. You can actually apply a bad TCP checksum. So you've got this like stream that's going off over the, the, to the broker and it's communicating with uh, Bing, Yahoo, whatever. The thing that you are really sending, you're really sending through your ISP. You send sins and acts and all that kind of good stuff, but you, you, you flip a few bits that make it all look like it's corrupt. And so it gets all the way to the destination and then the destination drops on the floor. This works great unless any of the middle boxes actually bother to check the TCP text on. Um, now it turns out there's a catch-22 here as well. Uh, the policy is disabled when checksums are bad. You can uh, basically prove the existence of a policy engine by having the broker provide good sums while you provide bad sums. It actually works kind of nicely. Uh, low TTL. You can control how many hops your outbound packets go. So you have a stream of packets that are going to, they're going to get past the NAT, they're going to get past the ISP, they're going to get past the policy engine, they're going to die in the middle of the internet. That way they'll never get to the server. You can do that too. The, uh, the ISP can go ahead and say, oh, we won't apply our policy engine unless the TTL is high enough. In which case it's another catch-22. But this time I can tell you at which hop the policy engine is at. So I, you know, I win again. But this is the one that is the thing that I gotta do. Okay, I think maybe 5% of the room is gonna get this. But it's so fun, I've gotta try. When a TCP stack receives a message that is not associated with an active socket, it's supposed to send a reset. It's supposed to say, you are sending me crap and I don't know what this crap is, so goodbye, you know, go away, reset. Um, but you see, we've got these things called firewalls that say anything that isn't perfect should just be dropped on the floor. Okay, that's great, because all we're trying to do is get a server to drop traffic on the floor, right? I agree. So, what we do is we have the client do an actual three-way handshake with the real Google. 
so client sends Google, Google replies to the client, you know, the, the thing, the session is set up. ISP sees the session, NAT sees the session, everything is good. But now, the broker goes ahead, the broker is in cahoots with the client, the broker knows all the sequence numbers and all the good crap, the broker sends a reset over to Google, shuts that crap down. Client has an open connection, NAT has an open connection, ISP has an open connection, Google is shut down. Broker goes ahead, it creates a session with Google. It's got a nice session, it's going back and forth, and you know what the broker does? Broker NATs its connection into the thing that is already open. So it knows what the client's expecting, it knows what the ISP's expecting, it goes ahead and links its connection over to the, uh, the original session. And here's where it gets awesome. Client's now sending traffic back and forth. Client's sending all this traffic to Google. Google, that connection was reset. Google ignores the crap out of it. Because that's not part of a valid session. And by firewall rules, if it's not part of a valid session, you must ignore it. So you basically, uh, you, you get to splice two connections together. It's a gnat that wraps around the internet. It is a really fun stunt. Uh, so, you know. As a final note, if you happen to be somebody who is passively monitoring network traffic, do be aware these techniques mean it is totally possible for a malicious client and server pair, or actually just a malicious client, to make it look like they're having a conversation with anyone they want you to think they're having, uh, particularly if a server ignores unassociated traffic. So please keep your logs, validate checksums, check your TTLs, etc. So, uh, Nooter will be out soon. Bug me if you're interested. Um, networks are neat. I hope you enjoy. Uh, I suppose I'm open for questions, but uh, actually I don't know, am I? Well, uh, maybe the, the people that aren't that hungry are, uh, could say and uh, pose a question to them. Anybody has a question for Dan?